Hello, I'm Christina Henderson, Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Welcome to our webinar, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Tech Companies in partnership with the University of Montana Corporate Training Program. This event is part of a series the Alliance is hosting with resources to help our communities deal with the impacts of current events. You can find details of these sessions at mthitech.org slash events. Today's webinar is presented in partnership with the University of Montana. Uh, so in a minute, Michael Braun, Director of Corporate Training for UM, is going to give a brief introduction to help frame our discussion. And then we will hear from four expert UM instructors, Tobin Miller Shearer, Elizabeth Hubble, Teresa Floyd and Michael Cassins, who will introduce some key concepts and methods for effective promotion and development of diversity, equity, and inclusion principles in the workplace. For the benefit of our speakers, I will watch the clock and signal when your time is up. And for the last part of the meeting, we will open the floor for discussion with the audience. Um, we've had some great questions submitted in advance, so we'll share those. And we would also ask the audience uh, you can mute your microphones until you have something to say. And then if you have a question or comment to share during the meeting, you can type it in the chat box. Or if you turn on your microphone, we'll see that and you can share uh, your comment in person. Um, and with that, I'd now like to turn the floor over to Mike Braun to get us started. Thank you, Christina. Yes, I'm Mike Braun, uh, UM's Director of Corporate Training. Uh, first of all, just to say that it's a true pleasure and privilege uh, to work together with uh, Christina and the Montana High Tech Business Alliance on this important and uh, much needed workshop. Um, we have a great panel of experts today who are going to give us an overview of some of the, the main issues uh, on this uh, uh, topic and then also provide us with a little bit of a sense of what these workshops uh, that will be coming later in July all entail and I'll get to that here uh, a, a bit, bit uh, later but right now I'd just like to bring a little bit of awareness to um, the corporate training program at UM which uh, has a nice moniker of powered by UM so as a service what we do is we work with trade associations like the Montana High Tech Business Alliance as well as profit and nonprofit organizations to really create skills and competencies training, workforce development initiatives, and talent uh, optimization programs. Um, so we focus really on employee acquisition and retention opportunities, reskilling and workplace productivity, really using our expertise that we've built obviously over decades in knowledge creation, education, and delivery, really to collaboratively develop and deliver training programs. So in this particular case with Montana High Tech Business Alliance, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Workshop is a three part highly interactive workshop that will introduce the participants to key concepts and methods for effective promotion and development of diversity, equity and inclusion principles in the workplace. So the participants and registrants are going to finish the workshop sequence with a much better and clearer analysis and understanding of gender, race, intersectionality, and privilege, as well as, you know, uh, gaining uh, skills and proven methods for implementing DEI principles uh, to affect substantive change. Um, the workshop, the three parts are uh, part one being uh, definitions and, and frameworks, with part two really focusing in on the business environment solutions, as well as current trends, and then part three, drilling down into organizational solutions uh, in terms of some of the politics and the culture, okay? So um, with that, again, thank you for the participants. Today, I see a lot of familiar names, so I, I appreciate the, the, the turnout. Uh, and, uh, and now what I'd like to do is give it back to Christina, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, now our first speaker is Tobin Miller Shearer, a history professor and the director of American, African American Studies at the University of Montana. Tobin? So good to be with you all. And I also recognize some names out there. Appreciate your time and attention on these important topics. I'm gonna run through some 
principles and ideas that particularly focus on issues of race and racism. Uh, in addition to my work as the director of African American Studies, I've spent about 30 years working in the dismantling racism field as a consultant. And I tried to boil down some of the main learnings about things that I have found to be most critical and most essential when a business is wanting to authentically work at issues of race and racism, rather than just trying to do window dressing. And from our conversations with Christina, I get the real sense that those of you who are on the call today definitely are engaged in the latter, that you're wanting to do this in an authentic, authentic way, in a way that can make an actual difference. A thing that I've learned to say at the beginnings of talks like these, that I know I'm no longer really interested in convincing anybody of anything. Um, what we have to offer here, we know works. Um, we've seen it work, and our goal is simply to try to help you do your job better. And in my particular field, race and racism get in the way, particularly of predominantly white institutions, from doing their jobs well. We want to equip you with the uh, ideas and principles and skills that can help you do your job better. So, Couple ideas that I, I want to put in front of you. Again, this is just an introduction to a much longer conversation, but I hope that these at least could be immediately helpful in some way, uh, way for you. Uh, you can see in front of you this idea that these are some of the most effective things. The things I've seen consistently across those businesses that are most successful is that first of all, they found a way to develop a common vocabulary for talking about race and racism. Most of us in our society, the business community is no different, don't have really good words, ways, and modalities of talking about race and racism, and we often trip over ourselves in the midst of trying to have a good conversation. We need to develop that common vocabulary so that we can talk with facility, with nuance, and with skill about this very important topic. That's just a basic reality to find a way to develop that common vocabulary. I'll, I'll mention in a moment some ways that, that can help you do that. The second most consistent thing is that those businesses who've been successful have equipped their leadership and staff with a shared analysis of race and racism. Not just having the words to talk about it, but having an analytical framework to understand what it is you're dealing with and develop effective strategies as a result. Quite often, the impulse is, let's just do something now. Let's get it done. We need to be uh, proactive and absolutely want to support that. But if you don't have a shared analysis, most of those efforts will peter out inside four months to a year. And what I've been saying now, particularly in response to the realities of Black Lives Move, uh, Matter movement that's moving across the country, is that it's not only what you're doing right now, What's equally, if perhaps more important, is what you're going to be doing a year from now and five years from now. And so the question I'm asking groups I'm consulting with is, what systems and training and analysis are you putting in place that's gonna equip you for that longer term work, not just the immediate reaction to make it look like you're doing something? Thirdly, those institutions have used a roadmap. That is, in, they haven't reinvented the wheel, to mix metaphors. They've found a way to work with organizations who've done this work in the past so that they're not replicating errors of the past. And we've got some resources that we think can be helpful in that way, but there are proven and consistent patterns of things that will work and things that won't work. I'll give you a for instance. One of the first impulses of predominantly white institutions is simply to hire as quickly as they can people of color and bring them into their organization. Well, obviously that's gonna be important. But those who haven't done the work to look at the deeper levels of institutional life for things like structure and constituency, mission, identity, purpose, the ways that uh, practices and programs are put in place, they haven't dealt with those facts of institutional life. Most often those hires, first of all, are difficult to recruit, and secondly, don't last long. Again, we're interested in long-term effective substantive change You've got to do some of that deeper work in order to prepare the ground in order to have effective hires. This one is particularly important in this moment we are right now. And that as we invite conversations about the realities of race and racism, we need to be prepared to listen to the grief and the criticism coming from the BIPOC, BIPOC community without defensiveness. 
the more we can have those open channels of communication and invite and expect that there will be grief and anger in that sharing, the more equipped we are for authentic change in any business that we're working in. There's a lot of grief, there's a lot of anger right now, and to pretend that that's not the effect is, to, uh, is not the case is to ignore an incredible reality that needs to be understood, needs to be listened to, and needs to be sat with for a while. Um, and I've just been reminded that again this morning in conversations I've had with some of my colleagues, that this is very real. A part of what we do is not only analytical, it's also affective. And in any environment, business, education, religious, we have to remember that. I'm going to just put three steps a business can take to be part of the solution, particularly in response to this Black Lives Matter moment. And there's many other issues we have to talk about. I, I simply, that's such a raw reality for so many of us at this moment, I wanted to get, at least get these ideas in front of you. Um, get some training in anti-racism for your staff and leadership. I know this ends up sounding self-serving. I also know it's true that unless you're equipped with these kind of training resources, it can be very difficult to find a way forward that has some lasting um, momentum to it. So we're not the only alpha that can do it. There's many others, but I think this is an important thing to invest your time and energy and to get good training that's not just trying to make us all feel good about ourselves, but is giving us analytical resources, skill-based training that can actually make a difference in our business settings. Uh, do an anti-racism audit. Again, focusing on racism. There's some great tools out there. Again, we offer some, but not the only ones, where you're doing a frank assessment of where you are so that you know where you need to go. Because the strategies are different depending upon where we are. If we're at a, a very earlier stage or a later stage, we're going to need to do things differently. And finally, uh, join the thousands of businesses across the country who publicly and unequivocally stated that Black Lives Matter. And then be open to feedback from the BIPAC community for having made that declaration. And I don't want to suggest that it's all a matter of just making statements. But I think when we can claim our support for a movement like this, I hear from my students all the, all the time when they're thinking about the jobs they want to go into, they want to be aligning with businesses and partners who are authentic, who are principled, and who are talking about real things in real ways. That's one way to do it. That's the only way. It may not be right for you. But um, I've been inspired by local businesses I'm a part of who've made that kind of choice and have been principled in doing so. So that was really quick. Those are my eight minutes. Thanks for your attention. I look, I'll look forward to some Q&A after my colleagues take a chance to talk as well. Back to you, Christina. Thank you, Tobin. Uh, now we'd like to hear from Elizabeth Hubble, PhD. She directs the University of Montana's Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program. Elizabeth? I even put a sticky note saying I was muted and I still can't remember it. Okay. Um, so, and everyone is free to call me um, Beth. That's absolutely fine. Um, I'm realizing now how profoundly I am echoing a lot of Tobin's thing, which isn't a surprise at all. Um, Tobin and I work together a lot. Um, and one of the reasons is, is, is just a profound belief on our part that you can't talk about race without also talking about gender, sexuality, um, social class, all of those things. Um, and so from my part is going to be introducing you to a number of concepts that I hope are going to be building some of that vocabulary um, because my the vocabulary that Tobin was talking about and so um, thinking about that um, you know one of the key things that I'm going to be talking about with everyone um, is building on a fairly old article now by Peggy McIntosh on privilege and oppression, looking at what does privilege mean, um, in what ways are, does that operate in our society, acknowledging my own privilege um, as, you know, and then on top of that, the really important concept of, of intersectionality, um, which is that I don't get to just speak for women. Um, my position on this this very kind of complicated wheel here is as a straight white middle class um and i could able-bodied all those things and so so my experience of race impacts my experience of gender and so just an awareness of how that works um really so 
you know, Macintosh's definition is something that we'll go through um, there. But this idea that that um, because of my race, because of my sexuality, um, I get certain, I get treated differently in our society. And we're going to explore kind of, you know, what does that mean? Um, I see privilege sometimes used as kind of a, a, a bad word or, or um, but for me, it just is one of the profound ways that my field of studies kind of explains the issues in our society. Um, and the reason that that's, that that's important along with intersectionality um, is that without understanding, um, coming from what Tobin said as well about not wanting to just um, have a reaction and put you know, changes in place now without understanding kind of the underlying explanation for why certain systems, um, systemic and institutionalized problems exist. If we don't have an underlying basis for that, um, just like Tobin said, some of these things tend to peter out um, after, after a few months and, months. and so intersectionality is a really key concept for me that, that when I teach, especially in Montana, I'm looking at the intersections of gender and race, particularly um, Native American and indigenous perspectives um, and sexuality, all of those things um, to, move, to move forward. Um, and so this is Kimberly Crenshaw. I always wanna give her credit for having, having come up with the concept, the word intersectionality, the concept's been there for a while. And she was in particular, in the in the 80s and 90s looking at at the intersection of sexism and racism um and so i always encourage people go watch her ted talk it's 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 a really good one um so um looking at my slides also timing myself i always talk too much um and so as kind of that foundation building on what Tobin said, when I teach this stuff to students um, at UM, I use an article by, by a woman named Charlotte Bunch who gave me a real way to kind of grasp um, what needs to happen to really enact change. And so Tobin and I as academics and, and Teresa and Michael too, although they are more facing out, um, um, is that we academics tend to live in one and two um and we don't always make those connections with three and four um and bunch argues without all of these different pieces talking to each other without analyzing it's hard to de determine what should exist and so going having this kind of concept in mind of of identifying the problem analyzing it determining what would look better and then working to change that. I see a lot of you here today with that in mind of how do we make our organizations more um, inclusive. So um, I was looking at some of the questions that people had already submitted and I saw a really important question about language. Um, Tobin brought that up as well um, around doing um, racism audits, things like that. And I wanted to point out with language as well, something that's really important to me that we will discuss quite a bit is the use of, of pronouns, the use of more inclusive pronouns um, where um, we're using a, a they to refer to um, individuals instead of he or she, um, looking at, um, at shifting, it's, that is a hard shift to make. Um, our brains are awful, are wired in those ways. And to me, it's really important because while it may not resonate with me on a personal level, when you are looking to hire more inclusively, you're looking at issues around gender identity and sexuality, um, people in the LGBTIQ plus community, they see those things and having inclusive language in, in policies, in job descriptions, things like that, shows people that they're not gonna have to do the teaching when they get there. Something my students express to me a lot is how tiring it is to feel like with every new encounter, they're having to re-explain why they use they or, um, issues like that. So keeping that in mind. Um, so I'm watching my time. Um, and so like Tobin, some things right now um, 
I strive always to be an ally, but I realized uh, a, quite a while ago that I can't just say I'm an ally. Ally is doing things. Um, and one of the things that we have to do um, is the analysis with, with the bunch model, but also realize that um, learning more is on us. Um, and we have to be okay with when we ask someone in a marginalized position a question that they can tell us no and that's what google is for um and so that getting comfortable with being uncomfortable um and just like building on exactly what tobin is looking at um is just the importance of language um it is really important to to um it is really important to the students that that i have today um, it is something they hone in on. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to wrap up there. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Uh, now we'll hear from Teresa Floyd, a management professor in the College of Business at the University of Montana. Hello, everyone. Um, so super happy to get to chat with you today. Um, I'm going to focus on why we think that it's important that business tackle these difficult problems, right? So the first thing that I want to point out is that uh, business is a dominant institution in the world, in the United States especially, right? So not only should we as business people acknowledge that our institution has done its part in reproducing inequality, right? Through our recruitment and hiring practices, through our promotion practices, through our compensation practices, to the roles that we allocate people into and to the way that we structure our organizations. All of those things have contributed to the reproduction of inequality. So we need to acknowledge um, ownership of that, but we also know that when businesses decide to make a change, the rest of society will follow. Um, I think that we're starting to see a lot of that happening where businesses are making changes that push policy changes that um, can help. So the other thing that I wanna point out, why does, why does it matter that businesses do these things is that um, income is the number one driver of enabling people to accumulate wealth, right? And so our um, uh, policy decisions and the way that we hire and promote and compensate our people has a huge impact on their ability to accumulate wealth. And we know that if we help our individual employees achieve their potential, we will change their lives and the lives of their descendants, et cetera. So, um, I really want to point out that, you know, as business people, we have a lot of power to do good. Um, so we should do it because it's the right thing to do, but we should also realize that diversity, equity, and inclusion benefit business in a huge number of ways as well, from more creative decisions to uh, better innovation, to um, better connection with our customers, to um, uh, having an easier time recruiting great employees, like all of these things. All right, so um, what we hope to do here, and Michael and I are kind of taking on the, um, the um, like, let's get our, roll up our sleeves and get down to business. Hopefully what Tobin and Beth are doing is giving us the vocabulary and the knowledge that we need in order to appreciate uh, the, the problem that we're all facing together. And what Michael and I hopefully are doing is giving some, um, some tools, uh, some ideas for policy and cultural changes that we can make in our businesses that will um, have an impact. Um, so a couple of things that I wanna point out. Uh, number one, businesses have had good intentions and have made attempts to improve DEI for decades, right? So it's not like this is a, a new thing that businesses have been trying to do. And um, like Tobin pointed out, some businesses have been a lot more successful than others in actually achieving things. And I would make the argument that after you create the shared language and the shared analysis of the problems that we're facing, the next thing you have to do is focus on changing behavior. 
right? And by um, making policy and culture changes that result in actual behavior changes are the things that will hopefully have um, better impact uh, in your organizations. So for instance, what does that mean? Um, we know that uh, we do a better job hiring diverse people than we do promoting diverse people, right? They call it the broken rung. So at the lower levels of the organization, the organization probably looks a whole lot more diverse. And then the farther you get, the closer you get to the top, the less diverse that organization starts to look. And um, one way to help to repair that broken rung and help your um, female and minority um, employees move to that next step and get into management level positions is to create a mentoring program where people are assigned the person that they're going to mentor, right? And the mentoring program is voluntary, so leaders can voluntarily decide to participate, but once they voluntarily decide to participate, they're assigned somebody. So they don't get to necessarily pick a person that they have a strong similarity with because we all feel more similar or more comfortable with people that we perceive as similar to us, right? Um, and also, you just don't, <laughs> if most of your leaders are white males, you're going to have to force them to have a mentor that's a female or a member of a minority group, or you're never going to have like mentors for those folks. But the, the way that this changes things is that when we get to know each other on a personal level, the differences start to disappear and the similarities that we have with each other start to emerge and those mentors start to take ownership of the career of that person that they're mentoring. And that enables that, uh, that sponsorship to happen and you get to say, hey, this person is an up and comer and you know, all those great things. So that, that's just, that's one idea um, that has been shown to actually work uh, to help repair that broken rung. And so I guess um, I'll wrap up by saying like the way that we're thinking about improving um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in organizations is to approach it like you would approach any other kind of strategic planning. Um, and I think Tobin kind of led right into this. Where are we now? Do an honest assessment of where we are. Where do we want to be? Set the goal, just like you would do for any other strategic initiative, and then create a plan for how to get there. And then assess your progress, make changes as needed, and create a, a feedback loop. Like keep, keep going back and trying again when you fail. Um, and then the end result hopefully is a stronger company, it's a better place to work, and you have a feeling of pride in what you've accomplished. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, Michael Cassens is an assistant professor in the School of Media Arts at the University of Montana and the director of UM Esports. Michael? Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. Uh, I'll, I could echo a lot of what everyone has already said uh, because I think we have a lot of similarities in the way we're trying to approach what we're doing. My part working with Teresa is looking at the community side of things. So when I when we did, when we created the esports team, we wanted to focus a lot on community aspect and the educational aspect of the team versus just competitive esports, which is where everyone kind of defaults to. But by doing that, what we did is we created a culture of diversity and inclusion. That's what we wanted to focus on primarily, which is the most important part to us. And there was a reason for that. One, we wanted to make sure that we created a team environment or an environment where people felt included, regardless of where they came from, regardless of what their uh, educational background was, their socioeconomic background was, what their racial background was, their uh, physical, mental ability, uh, their uh, sexuality, and creating this, this safe place for them to be. And the reason why we did that is we found that the team became much stronger. So we were able to prove that even though we didn't set out to be the best team that was, was out there competing, we were a much stronger team because of it. So we didn't focus on so much on skill as we did on how they were as a, as a group. Now, as a, as a technologist, so my, part of my background is coming from the technology world. So I started a startup in 
early or late 90s and have worked as a consultant for a number of years since then. And uh, so I get it. I get what it's like to work in technology. I get that there's turnover because people are headhunting technology people all the time. So creating a culture is hard sometimes and creating a culture where people get to know each other like Teresa was just talking about can be really hard because people uh, come and go or there's some inherent uh, fear because of uh, maybe uh, somebody's, you know, you're afraid that maybe somebody knows more than you because you're in technology. I'm not sure exactly why that is, but it's there. And so how we approach this in a different way, which is saying, how do we create this community? How do we create a community that, that reaches beyond what we we just know each other as coworkers? And that's not always easy to do because we all have lives and we all have things going on. But just like Teresa was saying, figuring out these ways where we have commonality, figuring out ways that we want to put in place these, these ways for each other to kind of be together. And that's not saying that we're always having barbecues with one another. What that means is, is that we have using Tobin and Elizabeth's, uh, their thoughts of having shared language, having a way that we say, hey, we're there for each other. And then going further and saying, not only having mentorships, but also having people that are leaders in this diversity and inclusion way. So giving them a voice to say, I want to be the leader within my group. I want to be the person that is there that can speak out and not only just be I'm going to be an ally as a as a person sitting here, but somebody that's willing to say. So I'll give you an example. When we had one of our uh, League of Legends teams, and I don't know how much you all know about gaming, but if you don't, I can tell you that in gaming, when it comes to women and when it comes to people of color, when it comes to any other type of marginalized uh, group, there is a toxicity that lives there. And it's tough. It's very difficult. And so breaking those barriers down has been one of my number one goals, but also our team's goal, because it is something that is so prevalent that it turns people away. Well, I'm guessing that this isn't, this isn't the only place. And so it's, it's figuring out, well, how do we create those voices? And so we had a foreign exchange student, a uh, young woman who became that, and we just kept promoting her to become that voice. And not in a draconian, you know, bring down the hammer kind of way, but in an encouraging way that makes people feel like they're part of something and making them feel like, like it's okay. And I think at the end of the day, we have to recognize and acknowledge that we're never going to be perfect and that it's okay. And so part of what I want to do is bring also into this idea of growth mindset of saying, how do we not only acknowledge that we have something to learn from, but how are we going to grow from there? So, uh, and I, I give that whole, that idea behind uh, growth mindset uh, to Carol Dweck. And so uh, I'm sure you all have heard of this before, but it, it can apply to this too, where we say, how do we start from somewhere and then grow and know that we can grow. And basically I like to think of it as in terms of uh, finding perfection within our imperfection. So how do we get there? So we all have things that are within us, our biases, our, our uh, things that have been taught to us even uh, subconsciously and, if, and how do we bring that out and have a safe place to talk about those things so that people feel like we can all grow as one. And I think as we do that, then we'll recognize that. And combining that with the policies that are there with the organization, that then makes people feel like they can talk about it. So like having a feedback loop by allowing people to discuss things like, I don't know, an in inappropriate email or something, a meme that comes through, sending that through, maybe through an anonymous channel, and then having that feedback come back, but discussing it. It has to be something that's always discussed on a continual basis. It's something that you know, as a person that's not a, uh, that loves confrontation, that means when I have to have a confrontational conversation with one of my players, it gives me angst, but I know I have to do it because it's, it's part of what we're, our mission is about. So we have to commit as organizational leaders, as businesses to say, this is something that's that important that we're willing to do. So as I think about this, and, and uh, you know, of course, obviously this is a bigger conversation, but as we talk about you know, tangible steps to do that. It's things like, how do we empower the people that are employees so that we're, as leaders, we're not always viewed as the parent and they're only gonna do the good things when we're not there or the right things when we're there. They're doing it because they want to do it and it's part of their new culture. And so 
that's what I'll, I'll, I'll leave with, but that's kind of the idea of how do we put that into practice. Thank you, Michael. I see some like virtual applause there. That's great. Um, so now we'd like to open up the floor to questions or comments from our audience. Um, part of why we organized this meeting, um, not as a webinar, but as a meeting is so that we can see your faces, hear your voices. And so if you have something to say or a question to ask, please feel free to do that live. Just turn on your mic and that will signal to us that you have something to say. Uh, you can also type your questions or comments into the chat box. Um, if you have resources or, or questions or anything like that, type that in there. Mike Braun is going to help me uh, field questions and, and facilitate a little bit of discussion here. And we also have had some questions submitted in advance from audience members. So maybe I'll start with one of those questions. And then if you have other, others to add, please share them. Um, so first question, um, what are some of the best ways to set goals and measure diversity within a tech company? And specifically when defining diversity, are there ways to avoid how it has been isolated to gender diversity? I can start at least a little bit because I saw that question before and so I was already thinking about it. And I, and I do, I think it is, is that intersectional approach. I think it is understanding um, how having an awareness of how different, what I call identity positions um, intersect with each other is at least one way to kind of lay the groundwork that, um, you know, Tobin Treese and, and, and Michael can maybe build on a little bit with that. But that was one of the things that came into, that came into my um, mind as I was thinking about that. Um, you know, just really important to realize, you know, how, for me, realizing how much my social class and my race have benefited me in my life um, and, and ways to, to think consciously and be aware of those things. So that's at least part of an answer. <laughs> I'll just jump in with another short comment. Uh, I'm fond of saying that hosting an oppression Olympic will help no one. Um, the more often institutions get into those very debates and end up doing nothing. We want to avoid that at all, co at all costs and recognize against oppression anywhere is a blow against oppression everywhere. In terms of metrics, um, part of our extended training includes examination of the full breadth of the institution. I did a sort of a brief reference for that in my, my talk, um, but we've uh, got some guidelines about how to look very specifically at issues of policy, program, practice, our um, structures, our constituency, our mission identity purpose, et cetera. But we've got some guidelines for that. And I think the, the heart of the question is exactly on point in that we don't just want to have general goals. We want to have very specific goals that are measurable, that are, are um, married to a timeline and have, as Teresa was mentioning, specific identifiable uh, individuals responsible for them with a way to figure out whether you've done it or not within a given time period. It's a great question. Maybe a follow-up question that I have thinking about this more broadly as a community. We do an annual high-tech industry survey, and to date we've never asked questions on that survey about anything related to diversity. Um, do you think, and, and I guess like maybe a follow-up, like would you be able to advise us on whether um, such data could be collected or how to go about doing that, like to take a look at our bigger industry? Yeah, I think that um, you can conduct an anonymous survey. Um, I've actually seen uh, anonymous surveys that have um, uh, uh, gone out to tens of thousands of tech workers across the US. And uh, they specifically ask a lot of questions about um, the intersectionality of people's identities. And then they also ask some tough questions about, okay, so how much are you paid? What's your role and level? Um, you know, those kinds of things to get an idea of um, career advancement opportunities. Um, in addition, I would say get rid of any compensation confidentiality policy that you have. It's better to be transparent and just be honest about what people are making 
if you really want to make a change. The, those confidentiality policies are um, poison. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and then also um, think about um, the diversity that you have at different levels of the organization. I think that you have to make a start somewhere, but also kind of being um, very uh, detailed, like Tobin was saying about um, where is the, the broken rung in your organization and what specific things can you change to improve that? I have a follow-up question with that. Um, around metrics, what are some examples of uh, appropriate metrics to be measured and how, uh, when you do hire a diverse person and then, you know, they get to know the culture and they know that there's these metrics, how do you prevent them from feeling like a diversity hire um, when you have these metrics and these goals? I can, I mean, and Tobin may be able to um, build on this. Um, I think that's where that longer conversation, that analysis, that language stuff comes in, where you are modeling in your policies, in those discussions that Michael was talking about, you're, you're modeling that this person isn't a token hire. Um, and so that's not necessarily a metric, but, you know, in terms of showing someone um, that that they are not just a diversity hire. It would be that that's the culture that you've created through the work that, that, that um, um, through the suggestions that, that, you know, Teresa and Michael made building on the analysis and uh, analysis and theory. I worked with a communications company a number of years ago who were asking the very same sort of questions that you asked. In the midst of doing their anti-racism audit and examining the ways in which they were engaged with their photography, their journalism, their technological representation, they discovered that they had moved from a dynamic in which they were always asking the diversity person within the organization to do the work for the organization to having a collective conversation in which they were sh had to share the analysis and vocabulary and were able to work collaboratively. Race was always on the table. Gender was always on the table. They were able to talk more about it, not less, and it was transformative for that company. Um, they went on to win awards for the reporting. Their, uh, their action, not just the reporting on what was being done in the field, but the way they did it in the field was transformed. The work of equipping an organization to be prepared to actually in collectively engage in dismantling racism totally sets aside that um, tokenizing dynamic, which is a very important thing to be concerned about, but it's all about how well are you equipped to do the work so that you no longer are asking individuals for, to do that work for you. And that's a huge paradigm shift with any organization. Yeah. I would, I would add, I would add a couple of um, potentially practical um, implications. Uh, number one, I don't know that um, everyone is aware that uh, quota filling is actually not legal. Um, and so I think that um, there's some misconceptions, at least among my MBA students, they think that like sometimes people are hired to fill some kind of quota in the organization and no organization is doing that because it's not legal to um, hire person just to fill a particular quota. So again, kind of like um, changing the language around um, hiring. Um, and then I think that ultimately, there's gonna be some pain points in the beginning. Um, and like Tobin said, the organization has to be committed to getting through to the other side when there are enough people of color or women or, you know, know of different physical abilities at higher levels of the organization so competence never becomes an issue um, but it, it takes a little while to get to that point but I think that ultimately um, more diversity higher up in the organization is um, the best thing that's going to help um, avoid that um, tokenism uh, you know, and I can speak to both sides, right? So I've, I've felt the uh, being hired or being put onto a board, uh, feeling as if I were a token Asian man. 
and I've also been hired as somebody based on you know skills and so forth. And the the way that it feels different is that uh, when someone is uh, is more transparent and is willing to talk about all these things and not try to hide the fact or try to say we're we're not going to acknowledge you know whatever is happening. Just like Tobin is saying here, talking about uh, all the factors that are in play here and being okay with that. And so that I can feel like we're gonna have an open conversation. And I think that's important is to acknowledge that there are going to be some changes or there's going to be some language that we can each discuss. And I think if it's brought out like, hey, this is something we're doing in a very, uh, in a very definitive and in a very, uh, uh, you know, a pro, you know uh, a very directed way, then it makes people feel as if they're not just doing it because, oh, well, this is the way you look, or this is the because you're a woman, or because it, it takes that off the table. And having all these discussions as to why you're, you're hiring or why you're, you're looking for specific people, that then brings it out. So talking about their skill set, talking about, you know, all the different things. And I think that's the important part of all of this. And, and it's much, then it, then it minimizes this feeling of being a token, because, you know, that's been something I've thought about you know, living and growing up in a predominantly, you know, Caucasian world in Montana, since I was, you know, since I was in, you know, grade school, knowing that even when I was in middle school and high school, and going on to different youth boards and things like that, it makes you feel like that when you don't have those conversations. So I think that's the important part is just having a really open and honest conversation about it changes the dynamic. Other questions from our audience? Hey, this is Jayton. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hey, um, I think one thing, hey Tobin, I think one thing to, to just add to that is um, when you, when a company or when an organization is um, opening their doors and, and, and showing that diversity and inclusion, you know, people are also looking at what's already been done. You know, like one thing that doesn't make me feel like a token is when I see other people like me within the organization. Um, <laughs> you can't be a token if there are other people there. Um, but also just the culture around it as well. You know, like I look at, does the organization already celebrate or um, acknowledge or promote Black History Month or MLK Day or any of the other <laughs> holidays and celebrations that are ultimately important to me. Uh, and when I'm encouraged to bring my whole self to work or, or, um, or, or walk in my truth, my, my truth is definitely everything that comes outside of work as well. And outside of work, uh, as we all know, what's, what's going on right now is, is, is pretty, um, it weighs, it weighs on a person, especially weighs on, um, you know, a person of color within these organizations. So one thing I just wanted to throw out there is that during those efforts is already acknowledging which, what you already have going on. Maybe it's going back to the audit thing that, that's been uh, spoken about already, but uh, those are things to keep in mind. The culture that you already have there and, and when you are um, including that diversity, uh, making sure that that's already in, uh, established. I think somebody brought it up earlier, maybe it was Christina or Teresa, but, a person doesn't want to come in and feel like they have to educate other people regarding diversity and inclusion. And then that's on top of the job um, that they're being hired for. Uh, that's a really, you talk about turnoffs, that's a big turnoff. So again, just my two cents there. Thank you, John. Uh, Michael, maybe th this is probably more directed to you, but one of the questions is, you know, you talked about, uh, the, some of the issues um, in esports, and I guess one of the questions is in terms of technology tools, also with social media and, and online in general, we've seen race related issues become amplified, but in what ways do you think that technology may be able to help efforts to have a constructive and, and more nuanced conversation about racial justice and equity? No, that's a great question. Uh, you know, you know, we so part of what we've done on the on the esports team is we partnered with uh, a company, a nationwide company called Inikey, and they talk a lot about diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion within gaming and within streaming. 
and particularly in the technology world. So it's, it's giving a voice to people of color, of women, of the LGBTQ community, all being online and being able to be themselves. And so part of what, how I see uh, all of our social media, how I see all of technology, helping basically bring that out into the open and reducing the anonymity, which is what I think causes a lot of the toxicity and increasing the moderation so that as people are being online, there's somebody that's, that's there, that's being present, uh, being aware. And so I think that that, uh, and I would never obviously uh, advocate for companies to be you know, looking over somebody's personal things, but at the same time, acknowledging and creating that culture of when we are part of this company, our culture is set like this. And this is the way that we conduct ourselves uh, in all aspects of our lives. And we do this because of this is who we are. It's not because it's just the right thing to do. It's because of who we are. And that if we assume that everyone is inherently good and then use our, our voices to do that, then, then we can be a lot, a lot more powerful in what we say and what we do. So that's kind of the way we promote it as far as uh, all of the technology, because we have students that want to stream. We have students that want to cast. We have students that want to do all sorts of things online and we say yes we want you to do that and remember you're representing who we are which is and then we reiterate which is we put out you know very very well detailed but not hard right it's just very simply detailed these are the points of what we believe in these are the things and we have it posted for them to read it know it and then they they start encapsulating that and then they when they walk in the room they know that this is who they are as a team and then they and then they promote that whenever they're online as well. So using technology to basically broaden their reach and broaden their voice. So that's what I would say about that. Well, and there's some really interesting research that I've seen. Um, you know, I've, I've read a lot of research into the toxic stuff online and in gaming. I've read all of that, but also um, recently I've read a, some interesting articles about for for people who may be um, trans, who may be gender fluid, non-binary, that online spaces have provided them a place to explore that when they're not comfortable doing it in their everyday lives yet. Um, and so that, that to me kind of resonated of, of, and it goes back to something I've known for a really long time. Um, this is less of an issue now, but I have, um, when I first started on this work um, 15 plus years ago, of, of some of my um, trans students saying, I didn't even know that was a word until I saw this person's video on YouTube. And so as a space to find that community that may not exist if, if you're like me and you're from Stanford, Montana, um, that, that, and so to me there are, um, um, I, I both read research and have had students and even been on a master's committee once in sociology looking at those positive aspects of, of exploring gender and sexuality um, in online spaces. I, I, I don't know how much more, uh, longer we have for questions, Christina. If, if nobody has another one, I'll throw one in from the panel, but please, um, I'd rather give it to them. We had one pop up in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, We've seen people being fired for racist, racist interactions and personal moments caught on camera. What is a filter to make that employment decision, firing versus training and giving opportunity for an employee to change? I think that's a, a really challenging question. The, again, it re relates to the immediacy and severity of response through social media. Um, a number of people have noted that more broadly, instances of racism in our country haven't necessarily increased. It's just that they've been caught on film. Mm -hmm. um, I think if it's in a workplace environment where there is an egregious evidence of overt racism, that needs to be dealt with immediately and and aggressively. I, I, I don't think you can just take a pass on it. Um, the, the question I think more importantly is how are you preparing your staff so that that doesn't even happen in the first place? Um, and I would have, be much more interested in investing energy in the proactive conversation than the reactive one. 
I, I understand there's all kinds of complexities with the reactive one, but I think part of equipping your organization is so that you don't even get to that place to begin with. Um, much more to talk about there, but again, I'm more interested in the proactive conversation than the reactive one at this point. Yeah, and then when it, you're not tokenizing one person, um, you know, to take it into a little bit more my gender world, you're not putting it on one person to explain why they use gender neutral pronouns. It's just part of the culture. It's not something they're having. And so if that's violated, it becomes more serious because it's in the policies, it's in the language and things like that. Um, and the other side of that for me would be that, that um, we're going to mess that up. And we just have to own those things on that level of language. Um, and it's that, that willing to say this is on that lower level of, of, of incidence of bias and things like that. Um, but if the climate's already there, it's less likely to happen. So. Yeah, I think it goes back to um, what Jayton said about bringing your whole self to work. I really like that idea. And I think that there's a lot of normative behavior that goes on in organizations that implicitly values white male behavior, you know, stature, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I think that um, the work that we have to do is we have to stop implicitly rewarding things that are, um, are white and male. Um, and that might mean like, you know, not giving feedback to a woman who cries when she's dealing with a tough situation because women cry, you know, not giving feedback to a black employee that, you know, they need to change the way that they talk in order to be taken seriously. Those things all kind of implicitly are showing that we value certain things if you want to move on in the organization. And I think that organizations need to be more open to wider varieties of leadership exemplar if that makes sense if that makes sense and then that way it does make you know those those normative things that we do are a form of racism and sexism and heteronormism as well right so we need to do away with those smaller instances if we want to avoid the the big overt um, problems as well thank you as we move into our last few minutes uh, one question that was posed in advance and that I've heard repeatedly from other people um, is what are some concrete next steps for tech companies in Montana? We would love to know opportunities that we can contribute with meaningful actions and not just words. Uh, how companies in Missoula or Montana, uh, which is severely lacking in diversity as a whole, can support the cause outside of just our company. And I don't know that we have time for a, a lengthy conversation about that question right now, but I'd like to invite Mike Braun to uh, maybe talk a little bit about the training that we're uh, working together with his team at UM to pull together to kind of help answer this, like what can we do as tech companies? Thank you, Christina, and, and thank you to the panelists and the participants. Um, you know, personally, I feel like we were just starting to dip below the surface here. So, um, you know, obviously this was meant as an initial uh, conversation and also to tee up this workshop that will be held uh, toward the latter half of July. So in terms of the administrative aspects, here's what uh, Montana High Tech Alliance and UM would like to do is first of all, gauge the interest of participants in this workshop. And again, it'll, there'll be a three-part workshop that will uh, be delivered in five hours. So we'll have a two-hour part of a workshop and then a three-hour part of the workshop. Uh, what we're right now uh, anticipating is that we will do it over two days, but we would like to hear from the, uh, the participants who would like to, to obviously sign up for this if they would like to do it in the morning or if they would like to do it rather in the afternoon over the lunch hour if the two plus three format will work. So to do that what uh, MHTBA will be doing is sending out a, um, a survey just to ask first of all are you interested in doing this workshop for your organization obviously it's not just for organizational leadership but really for you know all the ranks up and down the organization uh, and then the other thing is really to get a sense of what the preferred 
uh, dates and time slots are. So that will be going out in the next 24 hours. The other part to consider is that, you know, if your organization will register and have participants in this, upon conclusion of the five hour workshop, you will receive a certificate of completion. So the participants will receive a certificate of completion from the University of Montana. So these are just some of the uh, sort of logistical aspects, but you know, I think what you heard today was that this is a complex and multifaceted issue that needs uh, quite a little, uh, quite a bit of, of deep dive. And we have some wonderful uh, instructors here who will attend to all those. And the ones that you heard from are the ones who will be delivering the workshop. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay, and for other um, resources and other questions that maybe haven't been answered, we'll collect those and they can either be incorporated into the workshop or answered by our uh, speakers in the future. Um, a recording of today's presentation will be available on our website uh, at mthitech.org and also emailed to everyone who registered. And I'd also like to invite you to join the Alliance uh, as we read a book together, Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Think, and Do by Jennifer L. Eberhardt, PhD. We're hosting a virtual book discussion on Wednesday, July 22nd at 4.30 p.m. Details and links to register can be found at mthitech.org slash events. And again, that's open um, and free to the public as well. Um, and then we will be sending out the survey, as Mike mentioned, so you can indicate your interest if you'd like to receive more information about the three-part in-depth workshop for you and your organization. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing this conversation in the future.